Hello and welcome to the e-Partshala course on intellectual property rights. I am Yogesh Pai, Assistant Professor of Law at National Law University, Delhi. Today we are going to discuss a module on other forms of intellectual property rights. Previously in various modules we have discussed separate categories of intellectual property rights involving trademarks, trade secrets, patents, copyrights, industrial designs, geographical indications, plant variety protection and the like. Today we are going to discuss some of the remaining categories of intellectual property rights which either have legal basis or statutory basis in India's IP regime or have been formulated through various judicial opinions or some of the forms that we are going to discuss today are yet emerging or are been made as or are been demanded by the demand yours in relation to intellectual property. The learning objectives of this module are to understand how new and emerging forms of IP or other complementary rights that complement with IP are changing the emerging landscape of global IP protection and in India. To also examine the legal and conceptual basis for such regimes, to locate these new forms of intellectual property in the context of India's IP regime and to understand the common policy implications of having such additional regimes. The first we are going to discuss is the Semiconductor Integrated Circuits and Layout Designs Act. What is a semiconductor chip? If you look into any digital equipment, it is powered by any uh, some kind of a semiconductor chip. So the chip act defines semiconductor in technical terms to include these chips. Chips have a unique functionality wherein there are layers and layers of fabricated material and designs embedded in them which have transistors and knots and they act in binary as ands and knots. Now to protect such layout designs you need some specific intellectual property protection. You can think by way of patents or existing forms of industrial designs or copyright but these have largely presumed or are in fact not protective or either over protective of semiconductor chip designs. Chip layouts in layers you know they have three dimensional uh, properties, they are three dimensional in character, they are spatial representation and hence it is difficult to get them in current forms of uh, IP protection. There are certain developments in the United States, Japan and EU in the context of uh, semiconductor chip protection. In fact, United States was one of, the, one of the first countries to have the SCPA that is the Semiconductor Chip Protection Act in 1984 and this was because US industries, semiconductor chip industries were realizing that the existing forms of IP protection were not amenable to protect or not designed to protect semiconductor chips and hence they needed a sui generis form of legislation. They also knew that if such regimes were not evolved then countries like Japan which were competing with American companies would lead the way in semiconductor chip protection and hence they thought that it would be important to come out with a sui generis form of legislation. But in India semiconductor chip protection is widely unused. The first registration in this under this act was done only in 2014 October. It means there is, there is no semiconductor chip industry in India that needs such kind of a protection and yet we have this in the form of a domestic law. One of the reasons why we have it as a domestic law is because there is a clear cut mandate in the TRIPS agreement which requires that countries all WTO members should have such a form of legislation. But why sui generis for semiconductor chips? The copyright regime seems unsuitable. The standard of originality that you require for copyright law is distinct from the standard of originality that you require in case of semiconductor chip where the originality standard is a combination of known designs. The protection period is seemingly high in case of uh, uh, copyright which is life plus 60 years but the protection required for semiconductor chip is largely low because they have low shelf life. Unauthorized duplication of the chip is largely not uh, protected uh, and there also exists Indian expression dichotomy in case of copyright which uh, can hamper protection in case of semiconductor chip design. Patent law is also not very suitable because the high standard of inventive step cannot be achieved by minor changes in the functional aspects of uh, transistors and circuitry elements in the, the semiconductor chip because these are placed in a known way and they are a known combination 
of uh, uh, designs. The layout is a special organization which performs a function and such spatial organization or presentation has been expressly prohibited under the patents law because presentation of information have classically not been protected through patent law, but have been protected through other forms of intellectual property like the copyright regime. And what is important to understand although this semiconductor chip performs a function since they are spatial organization or spatial representation of designs, they need a distinct form of protection which is not afforded by patent law. Design law or industrial designs law also seems to be largely unsuitable because the industrial designs act provides for protection of those designs that appeal when judged solely by eye appeal to your eyes. But semiconductor chips do not contain any such appearance. They are largely functional in nature and functional designs are excluded by the designs law and hence there is a need for, for a sui generis regime. Section 7 of the semiconductor chip act in India looks into the condition of registration and it mentions that a layout design shall not be registered if it is not original, which means it should not be a commonplace design. However, a combination of designs is allowed. These should not be commercially exploited, which is not inherently distinctive. However, in case of commercial exploitation, you can have few years of commercial exploitation and then subsequently register under the act, which is not available in case of other regimes. For example, in patent law, you need to go first and file for a patent. In case of a semiconductor chip, you can commercially exploit and then uh, actually file for an application. In case of semiconductor chips, the requirement is also that these designs which are not inherently distinctive shall not be registered. The require, this is required only in the Indian Act, but there is no mention of such a uh, requirement in either the TRIPS agreement or the IPIC treaty, which is an international treaty for semiconductor chips. Now, such designs which are also not capable of being distinguishable from any other reg registered layout design is also not registered under the act. The protection period under the act is for 10 years. What is specifically important that in the context of infringement, reverse engineering is a basic exception that is provided under the law. If you look into section 18.3 and 18.4, they, de they have detailed provisions relating to reverse engineering. And why is reverse engineering needed in this area? Because of the very way in which the industry functions and the technology moves. There is a need for interoperability and largely these are a combination of known designs. So, let us look into one of the cases wherein the argument of reverse engineering or the defense of reverse engineering was articulated. In Brook Tree versus Advanced Micro Devices is an American decision of the federal circuit. Here they came to a conclusion, the court came to a conclusion that paper trail was not enough to show that there was no infringement, even while it might show evidence of reverse engineering trails. So, what this means is that the fact that you have maintained a paper trail during the trials that you do during reverse engineering is not sufficient to establish a fact that there was no infringement. Infringement must be judged also in the context of facts of whether there was actual copying. Failures in independent invention can also lead to infringement, which is akin to the patent protection wherein failures in independent invention can definitely lead to infringement of a patent. So, similar logic is also applied in case of Semiconductor Chip Protection Act. Another form of uh, intellectual property which is not discussed so much in Indian context is unfair competition. But interestingly, there are several statutory provisions in international regimes and also judicial cases that have evolved. International legal framework for unfair competition is laid down in the Paris Convention for protection of industrial property in 1883 and this was also revised recently by the Stockholm um, as recently as 1967 and also is now part of TRIPS mutatis mutandis. Article 2 of the Paris Convention defines industrial property in the broadest terms possible and it includes the repression of unfair competition. But what is unfair competition is not properly defined. 
Article 10 bis of the Paris Convention, which contains a non exhaustive list of, list of contraventions of honest practices in industrial and commercial matters, against all of which member states are required to provide effective protection. So, that is the mandate. TRIPS extends this logic of protection to GIs under Article 22.2b and also under Article 39 in relation to protection of undisclosed information as a species of unfair competition. What is interesting to know is that although unfair competition principles have been specifically laid down, still there is no clear cut idea among WTO member jurisdictions as to what exactly constitutes unfair competition and whether there is a clear cut mandate to be protected in several other areas where TRIPS or Paris convention has not specifically mentioned it. Unfair competition in India, we can look into one of the cases, Accord Internet Services versus Star India Private Limited. The case was decided in 2013 by the division bench of the Delhi High Court and is now pending with the Supreme Court as of July 2015. The 2012 agreement that was, uh, you know, that granted BCCI granted um, exclusive broadcasting rights to Star TV to disseminate the content and information emanating from live cricket matches and included other uh, copyrights emanating from recording of the live match. Now, there were some companies like Cirque Buzz, Idea Cellular and Online Mobile, they started SMS services providing you know ball to ball coverage of the live cricket matches and hence Star TV filed suits against these companies contending that their mobile distribution rights were violated. Now, these mobile distribution rights are uh, not statutorily provided in any kind of act as such and hence there was a claim towards unfair competition. The BCCI has actually taken a position in favor of uh, Star TV and has supported the contention that uh, uh, such rights accrued to Star TV and no other, other entity could use the rights without the permission of Star TV. Now, the Delhi High Court has come to a conclusion that and it has mentioned in clear way, uh, clear terms that such a right does not exist in the Indian context. It said creating property rights or quasi property rights in information which is what the plaintiffs that is Star TV and BCCI request to this court to do in this case stands to upset the statutory balance carefully created by the legislature through copyright act. In a domain where parliament has stepped into to create a statutory regime an exercise of creating supplementary rights in common law would result in obstructing legislative scheme as would be the case here. The court also went on to say the argument of the BCCI that it is under a duty by relying on you know Supreme Court judgment in uh, secretary versus ministry of broadcasting to monetize broadcasting and other rights and is doing exactly that by permitting star to monetize hot news by licensing mobile rights is misconceived to put it mildly. One can monetize or license, the court said, only that over which one has property rights. Neither star nor BCCI can be permitted to say that mentioning mobile rights and auctioning them would ipso facto legitimize the parceling away of a right to disseminate information. Without first establishing the right or exclusive domain over such rights existed in the first instance. Similarly, the plaintiff's reliance on New Delhi television that is the case above is of no avail. The division bench said in that case had to deal with the broadcast of sporting events by a news channel. The court has to deal whether the defendant's conduct amounted to fair use and they distinguished this current case from those that were decided earlier. The court also said that the rights claimed by the plaintiff over and above the broadcasting rights that is to prevent others from publishing or sharing match information or facts for irrespective of commercial and non-commercial use is precluded by section 16 of the copyright act. It is also precluded because the provisions of chapter 8 of the said act that is the copyright act. If parliament had intended such rights to exist, they would have been enacted with suitable mechanisms for their enforcement and effectuation. The court seems to have here considered the fact that section 16 provides very clearly that there is no copyright apart from what is provided in the act. So, this actually gives a kind of statutory basis co for copyright and hence no other form of common law rights can be claimed the you know as being closely aligned to copyright and the court seems to have noted the intent of the legislature in case of section 16 in interpreting section 16.
The court went on to say, in fact, the recent trend internationally to accord protection to rights information in varying degrees or to accept the doctrine of unfair competition, especially in the European Union, is pursuant to legislative action by European Council and not as a judicial extension. To the contrary, similar proposals for extending the scope of protection judicially was rejected in a line of cases and most notably they cited, you know, Cadbury. Uh, Schweppes Private Limited versus Pub Squash. This is a 1981 decision of the um, English courts reported in the Wales Law Reporter. Finally, the court said denying the claim about the tort of unfair competition does not betray the court's reticence to protect rights in intangible or to ensure fairness in the commercial dealings, but rather reflects sound judicial restraint to defer to the parliament's policy decisions represented in various intellectual property regimes and statutes. Here the court seems to have noted that uh, um, although you know there can be a claim for tort or unfair competition um, by denying such uh, a right at this moment in the current case, it was not going against the general sentiment of you know IP protection, but they said it reflects sound judicial restraint to defer to the parliament and policy decisions that the parliament proposes for various intellectual property statutes. In, in some ways, the court has exercised a lot of restraint in effectuating or giving effect to a new right by basing it in the in, in claims of unfair competition. The court also went on to say, equally, once we recognize that mere information cannot be subject matter of protection under common law, it becomes apparent that other means continue to remain unavailable to protect such information by way of an action for breach of common law duty of confidence, which is a right in personam against an individual, an individual who has come across such information under confidence and crucially is distinct from property right in such information itself opposable in rem. In circumstances of the present case, the eventuality does not arise. So, that is how the court was trying to distinguish, you know, the facts of the current case from other situations where a common law um, breach of duty uh, can be enforced. Some of the other forms of uh, intellectual property rights which are emerging as data exclusivity and patent linkage which have you no know, strong and long basis in comparative jurisdictions are still demanded in the current Indian context of uh, you know increasing intellectual property protection. It is important to note that India does not provide data exclusivity protection, but yet the demandors for data exclusivity have made these demands in the context of the EU India free trade agreements. So, hence it is important to know what data exclusivity actually entails. Now, data exclusivity provides legal protection for test and regulatory data for a specific period of time, where any subsequent generic approval cannot be granted by relying on the data that is already submitted by the originator. So, the data is safe and it cannot be uh, relied on for granting any kind of uh, uh, other uh, approvals or subsequent approvals. Article 39.3 of the TRIPS agreement does not require data exclusivity, but requires protection of such data against unfair commercial use. This standard has not been clarified in any WTO dispute and hence there is a lot of controversy of what actually should WTO members implement in terms of unfair commercial use in protecting test and regulatory data. Since India does not provide for data exclusivity, it provides for data protection by way of common law trade secret protection. Now, in India, the Drugs Controller General of India is allowed to grant permission by relying on the data submitted by the originator. And so, obligation on the DCGI is primarily not to disclose the data, but permissive reliance is allowed and is not covered by the common law trade secret protection. Patent linkage is another demand that has been made by the pharmaceutical industry and also the agrochemical industry. Here in the context of pharmaceuticals, a DCGI, a patent linkage mechanism would mean that the DCGI is required to police patents. But actually the DCGI is not a mechanism to police patents because patent rights are primarily private rights and while whereas, you know the grant of regulatory approval cannot be made contingent to the status of the patent. Now, the question of whether Indian IP regime broadly put along red along with the regulatory regime of the drugs and cosmetics act actually requires patent linkage in this connection 
or uh, we can recall the case of Bayo versus Union of India which a case which is now pending with the Supreme Court as of July 2015. The division bench of the uh, high court made certain observations and the division bench was actually uh, reading in appeal or sitting in appeal from the single judge uh, bench decision of Justice Ravindra Bhatt. Now here it was contended in this case by Bayer that uh, section 48 of the Patents Act, the patent holder has an absolute right to restrain anyone from making, using, offering for sale, selling or importing the drug covered by the patentable uh, patent subject in India, which in this case was sorafenib uh, tosylate. Further, uh, it, the petitioners also argued that section 2 of the Drugs and Cosmetics Act stated that the DCA that is the Drugs and Cosmetics Act shall be in addition to a law and not in derogation to any other law, which would include the Patents Act. So, consequently a combined reading of section 2 of the DCA along with section 48 of the Patents Act provided the concept of patent linkage. This is what was agitated by the petitioners. Now, petitioners also relied on what uh, a unique section that is section 156 of the Patent Act, which read as um, you know um, that there is uh, they wanted to read as casting an obligation on the government not to infringe patents. So, they said that when you read this along with section 48, it obliges DCGI whose office is part of central government to ensure that the patent granted in favor of buyer is not infringed by the granting of marketing approval to CIPLA, which is a defendant in this case in respect of imitation of Bayer's patented drug. The DCGI thus would be party to infringement and hence section 156 of the act does not allow government to actively support such kinds of infringement. Now, the court came to a conclusion that in the first place it said an analysis is required to be undertaken of the provisions in the Patents Act and the Drugs and Cosmetics Act and the Drugs and Cosmetic Rules. Under section 13.4 it recalled of the Patents Act, the grant of the patent shall not deemed in any way to warrant its validity and no liability shall be incurred by the central government in connection with any examination or investigation or any report or proceeding consequent thereon. In other words, a patent has been granted to an applicant can be challenged on various grounds in accordance with the Patents Act. So, hence the court came to a conclusion that and reading you know Bishwanath Radhe Prasad, uh, Radhe Prasad Shams decision in Hindustan versus Hindustan Metal Works in 1979, it said that it is a well settled law that grant of patent does not guarantee its validity. So, based on this they said that section 48 which has been expressly made subject to other provisions of the act confers on the patentee both where the subject matter of the patent is a product or a process the exclusive right to prevent from making using and doing other things in relation to the patents in India which are specifically provided in section 48. But it said it is a negative right which is enforceable at the instance of the patent holder and only subject to other provisions which permit challenge to the validity of the patent to be raised as a defense in case of suit for infringement. So, this the court said is evident from section 64 and section 107, section 64 dealing with revocation of patents and section 107 dealing with defenses for infringement. Therefore, it appears the court said that in relation to any steps that a patent holder might wish to take protect the patent from being infringed resort should be had only to the provisions of the Patents Act. Now, the court also said that although much emphasis has been laid down under section 2 of the DCA to suggest that this provision requires the DCGI to account for the Patents Act since provisions of DCA are expressly stated to be in addition to and not in derogation of any other law for time being in force. Now, this submission you know the court said proceeds on a misconception that a DCGI is required to account to the provisions of the Patents Act. The reference to section 156 that patent shall bind the government or uh, you know as it reads a patent shall have to all intents the like and effect as against the government as it is has against any person does not mean that a DCGI has to enforce the and protect the patent for the product in respect of which marketing approval is sought from being infringed. Now, the court said section 156 only states that the government cannot also infringe a patent. It is a negative obligation on the government not to infringe. It creates no duty or positive obligation on the central government or any department thereof to protect a patent from infri infringement. Now, this reasoning seems logical because it is well now impossible for the government to actually look into the motives of private businesses and look into whether they are infringing. 
Now infringement actions can be always taken uh, as private actions or civil actions under the Patents Act and such actions are to be taken by the patent holder himself. So the court by looking into the wordings of section 156 clearly said that there is no positive obligation the government to prevent private parties from infringing and this seems to be quite logical. Paragraph 22 of the decision also reads that in granting marketing approval to a patented drug, the DCGI is by no means itself infringing any patent or abetting the infringement of any patent by the applicant in whosoever favour the marketing approval is being granted. Such an agreement argument proceeds on the misconstruction of the scheme of DCA. The object of the DCA is to regulate the import, manufacture, distribution and sale of drugs and cosmetics. The numerous amendments made to DCA including the ones made in the 1982 amendment is which widened the definition of drugs or patent of proprietary medicine and introduced the concept of spurious drug did not require the DCJ to itself enforce a patented drug under the Patents Act and deny marketing approval to a generic version of the patented drug manufactured by the patentee. Now such claims were being made by the petitioners here that you know granting uh, 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 permission would actually uh, can be construed as granting permission to spurious drugs and that is why they said that you know there is no such connection. One of the important issues in relation to other forms of intellectual property is the protection of uh, non-original databases. Some jurisdictions like the European Union have specific directives relating to non-original databases. Now what are these non-original or non-original databases? As per the WIPO, the originality requirement that a database must constitute an intellectual creation by reason of selection or arrangement of its content in order to enjoy copyright protection means that some databases are not protected under copyright even if substantial investments have been made to produce them. It means the logic seems to be investment protection. It has been discussed whether such investment should be protected for example as a sui generis right. Another possibility is to use approach based on protection against misappropriation of or unfair competition. Now the WIPO seems to give kind of choices of how to come out with the protection for non-original databases because there is sufficient investment but it cannot constitute original in the sense because there is no originality in the content itself but there is originality in terms of selection and arrangement which is otherwise protected as a compilation under the copyright act. So how do we protect these other categories of uh, uh, you know um, uh, rights uh, that, that might be associated with uh, significant amount of investment being made by uh, the people who are investing in databases. This has huge long term implications both in the computer industry, in the biotech industry and several other industries which routinely rely on large uh, data. Non-original databases are not protected in India, original databases are protected under the Copyright Act. But some courts in antecedents point towards instances of protection of such databases. In Burlington Home Shopping versus Rajnish Chibur, this is a 1995 decision of the Delhi High Court there was a question whether certain types of compilations should be protected. Now here the court said a compilation which may be derived from a common source falls within the ambit of literary work. It also said a work of compilation of a nature similar to that of another will not by itself constitute an infringement of the copyright of another person's work written in the same pattern. Then it went on to say that the question whether an impugn work is colorable imitation of another person's work is always a question of fact and has to be determined from the circumstances of each case. Fourth it said the determining factor in finding whether another person's copyright has been infringed is to see whether the immune work is a slavish imitation and copy of another person's work or it bears the imp impress of the author's own labour and exertions. The aforesaid principles are by no means exhaustive that is what the court said. But the ratio of the decision seems to be in this particular paragraph. It said and I quote from the above statement of authorities and trends of judicial opinion that is clear, it is clear that a compilation of addresses developed by anyone devoting time, money, labour and skill though the sources may be commonly situated amounts to a literary work wherein the author has a copyright. Now the logic of this decision seems to be that wherever there is an argument for sufficient investment that has been done by the plaintiffs then naturally 
and if there is found, you know it is found that there is a slavish imitation it should not matter whether the basis is statutory the court can go on and protect you know such kinds of databases. Now this seems to be a per inquirium decision in the light of several other cases including the recent decision of Eastern Book Company versus DB Modak the Supreme Court decision wherein uh, the court has said that there is some level of modicum of creativity that may be required and what is not protected is the sweat of the brow. So, the in the light of subsequent decision how far Burlington home shopping decision is valid in law is a question. Finally, utility models is another regime that has been prevalent in many jurisdictions, but India does not definitely provide for utility model protection. The patent system requires invention to comply with novelty inventive step in industrial application and disclosure. Now, this leaves you know many inventions out of the gear of patent protection largely these are incremental workshop uh, improvements in nature made by firms large number of small and medium entities micro entities and these do not qualify for patent protection because the threshold for patent protection is quite high especially the inventive step standard. Now, what does the UM then allow? The utility models allow a right to exclude in for such inventions by diluting the criteria of inventive step and by fastening up the process of grant of utility model certificates. Now, the there are various mechanisms as to how you know you should uh, evolve or how you should resolve the issue of overlapping of rights and uh, different jurisdictions have evolved the models differently because there is a lot of flexibility primarily because these utility models are clearly not required by the TRIPS agreement there is no specific obligation that exists in the TRIPS agreement pertaining to utility models. However, Paris convention uses utility models within the domain of industrial property because the industrial property definition in the Paris convention is quite broad, but it is important to note that Paris convention does not clearly require to give effect to such uh, provisions. What is required in the Paris convention is if you have then you should you should comply with the national treatment provision. Similarly, in the TRIPS agreement now read mutatis mutandis along with the Paris convention you would require that both national treatment and most favored nation treatment are given effect to, but there is no positive obligation to implement UMs or utility models as such. Which are the countries which have utility models? China, Germany, Japan, Australia these are some of the countries which have utility models and there are several others you know which have enacted such utility models, but these are examples where they have uh, published reports and have you know uh, come out with uh, you know arguments in either in support or uh, you know. Um, conveying a mixed feeling of how the utility models legislations have worked in this country. There is a recent development in this regard recently the draft national IPR policy has recommended that in 2014 that India may want to look into the protection of uh, protection required for utility models. In summary we have discussed how new and emerging forms of intellectual property or other complementary rights are changing the emerging landscape of global IP regimes and Indian IP regime. We have looked into the legal and conceptual basis of such regimes by way of examining specific legislations like the Semiconductor Chip Act. We have also looked into several decisions involving unfair competition. We have looked into the demands for data exclusivity, looked into the concept of patent linkage which has been rejected in India. We have looked into the concept of non-original databases which are not statutorily provided in India, but yet some of the judicial decisions point towards the direction of non-original databases. We have also looked into the need and the demand for utility models legislation. We have looked into and located them these acts and these uh, regimes in the context of India's statutory and case law jurisprudence evolution. We have discussed the common policy implications of having such regimes. With this we conclude the module. Thank you very much.